thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 131, Third Time's the Charm. In Churchill's first telegram as the Prime Minister of Great Britain to the American President, he requested some of the U.S.'s older destroyers, about 40 or so, be handed over for everything from convoy duty to guarding the home island. At the time, this was just one more thing for the president to consider in trying to help Britain. But FDR knew his own country well enough to know that giving anything away or even selling these older ships in a time of danger from Europe would be looked upon unkindly by the American people. The cash would be welcomed, but not the resulting perceived vulnerability. Yet the president also knew the businessmen of his country. The men of means throughout the U.S., the New World, were always looking for ways to best the businessmen from the Old World. If somehow the giving over of the destroyers was possible, the only way it could happen was if he convinced the American financiers and the congressmen in their pockets that they were getting over on their British counterparts. Yet a seed of an idea was planted. If a trade was improbable and Britain only had so much money, the word lease, or something like it, would have to be raised. In fact, it had been. In a letter to the President from the U.S. Ambassador to France, William Bullitt, and very few people were for leasing anything. So between May and September of 1940, the various pieces of some kind of trade were floating around Washington and London. The British needed more ships, and America, in some parts, wanted to help, while keeping herself safe. The Caribbean bases under British control could be leased to the United States to protect them, but they could only be leased, thanks to a new law that said territory in the area could not be transferred. Some non-interventionists had wanted the bases given to the U.S. years ago in lieu of payments from World War I. The British were not too keen on that. But as much as has been written about the exchange of bases for destroyers, the truth is it wasn't much of an issue and did not factor into the future Lend-Lease Bill put before Congress nor did it help the British with their immediate problems of fending off a German invasion. But an exchange of some kind would come about and originate from a most unlikely source, the antagonistic Secretary of State Cordell Hall. He wasn't crazy about any move that would weaken the U.S., but admitted on more than one occasion that Hitler himself wasn't exactly a stickler for observing established laws either. Something had to be done to help Britain, if it only bought America more time. As for ignoring the laws outright and taking over the bases to project American military power and securing lands considered under U.S. protection, the president closed the door on that using a couple of nails. When Lord Lothian, the British ambassador to the U.S., brought up the idea just to see where FDR stood, the American president said, with more heat than usual, quote, See here, Philip, you may as well get this straight once and for all. I'm not purchasing any headaches for the United States. We do not want your colonies, unquote. This was expressed later, and again heatedly, during the Lend-Lease debate. But by August of 1940, with France out of the war and Britain being pounded by German bombs, Churchill wrote to the president that if the UK was forced to negotiate a peace with the Nazis, British possessions in the Caribbean could end up in German hands. So between that dreaded possible future and Cordell Hall coming around to the idea of the American businessmen getting over on the British, a deal was struck and signed on September 3rd. Fifty mothball destroyers of three different classes would be handed over by the U.S. Their type would be changed to a town-class status, named after towns common in the U.S. and the U.K. In exchange, the U.S. would be granted the ability to build air or naval bases 
also getting the land around them, with a 99-year rent-free lease on the eastern side of the Bahamas, the southern coast of Jamaica, the western coast of St. Lucia, the western coast of Trinidad and Antigua. U.S. bases would also be set up on Newfoundland and Bermuda, but as for these last two, the British maintained a strong presence there, as these locations were vital to cross-Atlantic shipping. The British had been losing many a ship in trying to feed and supply the home island, with resulting losses of life. And this information, when it was put out, at the insistence of Secretary of Treasury Morgenthau, became another straw of hay on the scale that weighed in favor of the exchange. Of course, Nazi Germany did not view this exchange as America remaining neutral, and she was right. The U.S. had just taken a major step away from isolationism. And, of course, this exchange was better for the Americans than the British. Of the 50 ships sent over, only 30 could be used in 1940. The rest had to have serious upgrades. But that was the only way this deal could go through for the Americans. Now that the idea of an exchange was established, and Congress didn't seem to be fighting it, another trade was made with China. They wanted money to buy arms and food, yet America saw this as good money going down a rabbit hole. But soon, someone brought up the idea of the Chinese repaying in ore. This was a good deal for the Americans, so it was approved. Another step towards Lend-Lease was taken. Another trade that would help the Allies along the road to the Lend-Lease bill was the two powers trading technology. Britain sent over the details of their Merlin aircraft engines, which duly impressed the U.S. into believing that the home island may yet hold out. But as hope began to rise that Britain might still be in the war at the end of 1940, Many American businessmen still did not believe that she could make payments into the future. So American producers continued to demand large payments up front, or timely monthly payments. Both continued to drain the empire's shrinking reserves of gold. So as September ended, London made their grave financial situation clear to Washington, which was fine with Morgenthau. Perhaps it would spark those who still fought against or were on the fence of helping Britain during their darkest hour. All he cared about was that the information did not leak to the public. If the man on the street knew that Britain would soon be out of gold, or more correctly, soon not have enough to keep their economy going, what support there was would shrink away. Simply, America wasn't ready to come into the war or enthusiastically, financially help Britain fight the war. Britain must go on paying for American goods. That was all there was to it, for now. So Lord Lothian was told to send a liquidator over to help sell off British-owned American properties. Not that the sales of those would really make a difference, given what was needed. And there was other opposition. In September of 1940, the America First Committee was created. They didn't mind selling goods to Britain as long as it did not hinder their country's ability to gear up for war. But they were completely opposed to investing in Britain's future by handing over weapons and hoping for payment somewhere down the road. On August 2nd, Harold Eccles, the Secretary of the Interior, wrote a personal letter to the president. In it, he was trying to wrap his mind around this entire problem of aiding their assumed ally. And putting aside any highfalutin expressions, the man saw it like the average American would. Quote, it seems to me that we Americans are like the householder who refuses to lend or sell his fire extinguishers to help out the fire in a house that is right next door although that house is ablaze and the wind is blowing from that direction, unquote. This analogy stuck with the president, who would use an altered form of it in the future to explain Lend-Lease. 
But one thing was clear as the election approached. It was time for Congress to get into the game. The White House had done all it could, probably a bit more than it should have, to help London. The laws needed to be changed, and in regards to the general election, the question of aiding Britain was not a question or issue during the election. Wendell Wilkie, the Republican candidate, wanted to help Britain as well, wanted to help anyone fighting the Germans, but couldn't say so with any enthusiasm, as it would destroy the Republican Party which meant that FDR did not have to fend off questions about what he had done or wanted to do in the future. So, as the Battle of Britain was at its height, the American people and their politicians stuck to domestic issues, which played nicely into FDR's hands. The one issue that could have made life hard for the president during the election was the arrival of Sir Walter Layton, Director General of Programs, for the British Ministry of Supply. His job was to come over and give Purvis, head of the British Purchasing Committee, a hand in deciding if the British should use American weapons or have their orders custom-made. This could have raised many uncomfortable questions, but as the man came to America, Germany, Japan, and Italy signed the Tripartite Pact near the end of September, which was squarely aimed at the United States. American fear rose as its attention span focused on Japan and Germany. As the election approached, Lord Lothian went quietly back to London, knowing he couldn't get anything done until after the election. And though FDR was gunning for a third unprecedented term, having played his cards safely, the people chose to stay the course in their domestic and financial troubles. The war was somewhere else. But now that the election was behind their ally in the White House, the British looked to the day when ships, planes, guns, and ammunition of all kinds started raining down on them, in a good way, to then rain down on Germany. But it didn't quite happen like that. FDR continued to seem unmoved by the growing British gold drain and a need for credit. There were those that wanted an investigation that would uncover exactly what Britain owned in the U.S., but mercifully, that died in committee. And then the 77th Congress came to an end, and it was only then that FDR decided to act. Back in November, the military leaders of the U.S. had come to the common conclusion that it was time to support Britain against Germany, until the U.S. came in, which was only a matter of time. That right there was a major step, but even this stemmed from something that had started back in April of that year, Plan DOG. Plan DOG, or Plan D, the fourth possible plan created to fight Germany, called for both countries to fight side by side offensively in Europe while fighting defensively in Asia. First knock out Germany and Italy, and then go after Japan. And the plan like that called for a specific action. First, the chiefs of staff of both countries would have to work together, and equally important, the U.S. would have to aid Britain in every possible way, including all the way up to war. All this meant, again, it was time to bring in Congress. And yet, this was all in theory, on paper, behind closed doors. Yet the Americans were about to get a wake-up call they could not turn their back on. Was this calculated? Oh, yes. But by whom? Who knows? Returning from his forced vacation while the election was going on, Lord Lothian, the British ambassador, thrust the issue of American credit to Britain to the fore by casually announcing on his return, Well, boys, Britain is broke. It's your money we want. And he said it again later that day. The issue was out there. Following hard upon this declaration of aided war, Lothian also said that soon Sir Frederick Phillips would be coming over to work out the details. Britain could pay for about another six months, but that was it. 
period. Rumors swirled. People talked. And the idea of loaning Britain credits was out there. As in, you may not like the smell of something, but if exposed to it long enough, you get used to it. Philip showed up in Washington on December 4th, and he brought more information about Britain's finances. And it was all bad. The Brits were out of money. What possessions they had left could be used as collateral, but not sold away to create dollars, or there would be nothing left of the empire. But honestly, the U.S. president still didn't get it. Yet every time he was asked, Morgenthau put it out that Phillips was only here to hand over detailed information about Britain's financial situation, not to discuss obtaining credit. But everyone working with FDR knew this had to happen, which meant, again, bringing in Congress. However, in gearing up for bringing in that deliberative body, Morgenthau tried to get from the British what they would need between now and September 1st of 1941. The answer was, more than you want to give and more than we can pay for. Regardless, it was time to pave the way for the American people and Congress to accept some form of assistance that had to happen, or Britain would go under. And this got underway when the president returned from a two-week cruise in the Caribbean, unwinding from his recent campaign. Aboard the heavy cruiser, the USS Tuscaloosa, having left Washington on December 2nd, FDR, as was his wont, took in everything from over the last year. But then he got a letter from Churchill on December 9th. His ship was tracked down and the letter handed over. The president read the letter and then reread it, and despite being on vacation, talked to no one the next day. The day after that, he told Harry Hopkins of his idea of Lendley's. That's one version. The other is that FDR read the letter, talked it over at length with Hopkins, and then drew up the plans, sans details, of Lendley's. Either way, the president probably took in all the things said to him and the things that happened over the year, got away to a quiet place, and figured out the best way to help Britain, considering all their limitations and their current situation. FDR returned on December 16th, and the next day casually met with the reporters, who had sensed something was up. But the president was all relaxed smiles, saying he had nothing major to announce. But he did want to talk about aid to Britain. First off, it was time to let go of finances in the traditional terms. And even thinking from a selfish American point of view, it just made good sense to back Britain, if only to keep the U.S. out of the war. Simply, the U.S. would take over British orders, create the items, and then, oh, I don't know, lease or sell the items to Britain. Then he used the neighbor's house on fire analogy. But in this case, if the water hose you loaned the neighbor was damaged, they could replace it after the fire was put out. This way, the almighty dollar was left out. Britain got what it wanted, the U.S. got extra security, and no one lost any money, in theory. And as FDR was as good a lawyer as he was a banker, when asked, so who would hold the legal title to all these things created? He replied, I don't know, and I don't care. Now that the call was given, it was time to draft a bill and put it before Congress. This would be the isolationists' last chance. But even though the president had his majority reduced in both houses during the election, his party still ran the show. And whether it was calculated brilliance or just extreme reluctance to act, by the time this all came about, just over 50% of the American people were ready to back Britain, many even if it meant war. Officially, the staffs of the White House and their comrades got their marching orders in regards to drumming up support for this bill on December 29th during one of FDR's fireside chats. It was here that the president declared that the U.S. would be the arsenal of democracy. Everyone 
was put on notice. The Russians covered the events in their newspapers rather accurately. The British were thrilled. Germany replied with its own stiff upper lip. But Japan was suddenly nervous. Would the U.S. give Britain enough material to challenge them in Asia? But now that the president was going for broke, or as a White House aide put it, shoot the works, FDR told the drafting team he wanted the power. He would make the decision of who got what and how much. No Congress, no purchasing committee, no remolding of the neutrality acts. This was to be started from scratch, and yet he wanted it done now. A draft was written up during the last days of December. It was revised a few times, within hours of the previous draft, but honestly changed little. The president would be given full authority to create orders and decide what went where to who. And just to show how fast the president could move when he was of a mind to, once the draft was done, the initials of those that were needed started covering the front page. The last person to initial his OK was the president at 5.15 p.m. on January 7th. But now that they had a bill, it was time for politics. Knowing there was strong opposition on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, it was decided to steer clear of that in order to get the bill to the main floor. It's worth noting that before World War II, the Foreign Affairs Committee was not the powerhouse it is now. Still, if the bill was stuck in that committee, it would never see the light of day. But then the British, obviously happy with these events, couldn't help but ask, what about the orders placed by them during the bill's process into law? The solution, for now, was to put into the bill a proviso to consider orders made before December 17, 1940 when the president made his speech after his vacation. And during the bill's process, Britain was limited to placing orders of only $35 million each week. As for the money for the orders at the moment, the president insisted, and the British complied, not having much of a choice, that gold from South Africa be sent to the U.S. in American ships. Was this harsh? Considering a bill had been written, yes, but the president needed to give the appearance that he was pressing the British to pay for things themselves as much as possible. He even went after the French gold, worth some $285 million being held in Canada. But Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King squashed that. Still, the gesture was noticed by the American public. Now that there was a bill, something specific could be fought over, and the fighting commenced. The Irish Americans were not excited about helping the British, but this was given a new point of view when a representative of the administration said that the Vatican itself was surrounded by totalitarianism. If anything, the Lend-Lease Bill was fighting for Catholicism. It was a nice touch. On Friday, January 10, 1941, John McCormick, a Democratic representative from Massachusetts, stood up in the House of Representatives to introduce, quote, a bill further to promote the defense of the United States and for other purposes, unquote. Almost at the same time, the same bill was brought up in the Senate. And though the bills proposed to give the president tremendous power, those working for it stressed that Congress would still have a say as a separate appropriation bill was required. This went a long way to making the Lend-Lease Bill, for some, more palatable. And now the opposing forces were enjoined. This was too much power for the president. Counter-argument. If this was going to work, speed was needed. This will lead the U.S. into getting into the war, killing every fourth American boy. This was to keep America out of the war. This was a fascist bill. Congress would get to choose the amounts used. There was no way Germany could defeat Great Britain. Uh, shall I run down the list of conquered nations? And some enemies were already within the FDR camp. 
Secretary of State Hall declared that he still thought Britain should put up their remaining possessions as collateral, and that he would only answer non-financial questions. But as this was a bill about credit, FDR smoothly stepped in and wrote out much of Hull's opening statement for when it came his time to testify on the bill's behalf. On January 15th, five days later, the House Foreign Affairs Committee began its hearings on H.R. 1776, the Lend-Lease Bill. Its doings would be on the front page of every major American newspaper and of other countries for weeks. But even here, the White House had the advantage as this dealt with foreign policy and military affairs. FDR and co. had all the information, and mostly released only what was good for them. And it's worth keeping in mind that the White House easily had the votes in both houses of Congress to push this through. But FDR wanted a consensus. He wanted momentum, certainly when it came to the appropriations part of the bill. So, witnesses pro and con were brought up and questioned. Secretary of State Hull, using FDR's words, started things out by saying, This was to help defeat the members of the tripartite pact, the men who wanted to control the world, which gave the anti-Lend-Lease witnesses the stink of being opposed to that. When Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox spoke, he made it clear that, Although they could and would build up the U.S. Navy, they couldn't protect both coasts of this large country at the same time. If Britain was removed from the war, the combined fleets of Germany, Italy, and Japan would simply be too much for the U.S., period. This argument was countered by the phrase, and thinking of, pardon the blatant racism here, that one American can lick any ten Indians. When Charles Lindbergh, the man who made the first solo flight across the Atlantic in 1927, testified, he was asked point-blank, being suspected of being pro-German, which side did he want to win? He answered, neither. Germany was going to win, and the U.S. had to get used to that idea, but that he seriously doubted that Europe or America could successfully invade the other. His testimony left a bad taste in many a mouth, and everyone seemed happy to let the man walk away from the spotlight. When former ambassador to Britain Joseph P. Kennedy spoke, he remained consistent to his time with the administration. America should stay out of this. It was too late to help Britain. Germany would win, and yes, he hated everything about Hitlerism. His testimony made no real difference. As the testimonies were not going their way, the isolationists started attempting to attack on amendments. There should be a time limit. The U.S. should grab whatever British possessions they could if they were beaten by Germany, and the like. But they failed. After all, the pro lend crowd had the numbers in the House and the Senate committees to vote them down. By the end of January, the bill had made it out of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House. On February 8, 1941, the Lend-Lease Bill passed the House by a vote of 260 to 165. As for the committee in the Senate, the bill came through there during the second week of February. When its floor vote came, the result was 64 and 31 against. Several senators did not vote but expressed their positions. During its time in the Senate, the bill had a few amendments attached, but the House, well, those in favor of the bill, hoping to avoid a repeat vote on a slightly different bill, created a resolution to accept the Senate's version. This would be given a two-hour debate on March 11th. The pro-Lend-Lease faction would control the debate for one hour, Those opposed would have the second hour. The speeches came and went, but those in FDR's camp had the numbers. The House passed the Senate amended version 317 to 71. It was then rushed to the White House, where President Roosevelt signed the bill into law 
at 3.50 that same afternoon, March 11th. Of course, there were details to work out. The appropriations bill, creating the executive body that would do the grunt work after the president made his decisions. But in the end, FDR got, mostly, what he wanted. But there was one last sacrifice the British had to make. Now that the bill was passed, there was a question about orders already placed. Did Britain, who couldn't afford it, have to pay for those? The president had the answer, not that London would like it. The sacrificial lamb chosen was the Viscose Corporation, an entity on American soil, but 97% owned by Britons. It went on sale, and much was made of this. But then Morgenthau was able to make good his promise to America's new ally. Having secured a massive loan from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, Britain would no longer have to sell American investments to pay for goods coming their way. Within that same month of March, the Appropriations Bill was passed. Seven billion dollars would be used to help the Allies, as in plural. The U.S. and Britain knew that Russia would be attacked soon by Germany, so it was foreseeable that Moscow might be getting money in the future as well to fight the enemy. There was still friction and egos to overcome as the U.S. and the U.K. came together to fight tyranny, but they were working them out. Meanwhile, over time, Germany got bogged down in the quagmire that is Russia, and within seven months of the passing of the Lend-Lease Act, Japan made a decision that would reduce it, eventually, to a conquered nation. In short, against the evils of fascism and imperialism, the U.S. provided the sword, Russia the sinew, and Great Britain the mighty heart. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So as far as those who have bought mugs and signed up for membership, I'll um, thank you next time. I just wanted to hurry up and put this out. So we're done with Lend-Lease, and um, we're going to be getting on to Russia. But before I go, I want to apologize to every single British citizen, national, subject, I'm not sure what you call yourself, um, over a mis misunderstanding I had earlier this week. Um, I saw a picture on a postcard of a lighthouse in some water, and I just saw, I was glancing at it, I saw the name London, and I just assumed that there was some kind of lighthouse slash house at the mouth of the Thames. And as no one from Britain has told me about this, I got mad at every single one of you for not telling me, because this just looked amazing, it was beautiful. So anyway, I got on Facebook, and I kind of uh, tore into you guys for not telling me, and, and I was saying, like, I was disappointed that no one's told me about this. It didn't take long for some of you to come back and go, uh, Ray, that's not ours. That's yours. And I think it's in Connecticut. So totally my bad. I apologize for that. For um, I said bad things about you, uh, your family members, and even your pets. And I know you British take your, your pets seriously. So I want to apologize to every single one of you. I am so sorry. And when I come to London next July, and I absolutely am, no tours, no nothing, just me and the family buying plane tickets and finding a couple places to say we're going to go all around London for two weeks. When I come and if I meet any of you and you bring up the lighthouse situation, I will buy you uh, a drink. And that's just again, my way of saying I'm so sorry for all those things I said and, and wrote and thought about you. So anyway, no hard feelings. Everything is done. Uh, North Africa is kind of calm because Rommel will not be getting resupplied. The the allies, the British, are building up to hit him again with their new leader, Auchinleck. The Middle East, as in Syria and Iraq, that's all pretty calm at the moment. Um, Greece has already been conquered. The, the naval war in the Atlantic is going on. The British are losing ships left and right. Germany is still bombing Britain, but I think um, London is bombing them back, if my memory serves, mostly at night to, to protect their pilots. So everything is done. Everything is in its place. The stage is set. It is now time to move on to Russia. <laughs>